So, um, are, you, are you recording it? Yep. Done. Right. So, so this is how the the Bible shows us um, um, how it makes this heavenly spiritual principle help so us to understand. Uh -huh. And also, can you share your screen? No. No. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, well, maybe yes, but, um, I think, I think what's important if you have your Bibles and just listen to me okay. because tonight is just, uh, I'm just taking you through the Bible. There's no, there's no kind of uh, new ideas. It's almost like an old, old stuff that you may have known, but I'm just putting them together into a structure, which will help you to understand how, uh, this heavenly spiritual principle is used uh, to apply the scriptures to us today. Is that, is that all right? Is it clear? Yeah. So, I mean, if you have your Bibles, Deuteronomy 25 verse 4, I'm, I'm just showing you an example, and then I'll take you through the whole of tonight. I'll take you through how the Bible helps us to understand Psalm 23. I'm assuming that Psalm 23 is one of the scripture passages that you are most familiar with, and I'll show you how within the scriptures uh, it has um, it interprets Psalm 23 in a spiritual and heavenly way so that we uh, can see that it didn't really mean David but it can also be applied to us today. Is that all right? You can always stop me anytime. So let me give you an example of how this uh, heavenly spiritual principle is at work in scriptures. So if you have Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, and it says this, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. So, I mean, it's clearly about an ox. I'm not really sure how you would have interpreted that. Um, because we don't have oxes today, and we don't have grain. Do you see what I'm saying? So, but this passage is used um, in 1 Corinthians 9 from verses 7 to 10, okay? 1 Corinthians 9, verses 7 to 10. Let me read that to you. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? Then verse 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. So that's 1 Corinthians 9, and that's verse 9, right? And then Paul continues on in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 9. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely, verse 10, surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes. This was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. And then verse 11. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? So you see that the word about an ox in Deuteronomy 25 is now used for us who... Uh, preachers of the gospel um, and the parallel is that uh, just as the ox was treading out the grain for food in the Old Testament we preachers are treading out the gospel as the spiritual seed sown amongst you believers uh, do you see what, I'm, what I mean by this heavenly spiritual principle being at work so it's about ox in the Old Testament, but through Jesus, it's applied to the gospel, right? Gospel workers living out of the work of proclaiming the gospel. And then again, of course, if you come with me to Psalm 8, you have your Bible open to Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. And um, Psalm 8 is a, is a psalm about creation. And how God created everything. And then in verse 4, it says uh, this. 
what is mankind that you're mindful of them human beings that you care for them you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, birds uh, in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. You see, it, it's a, so this is, in Psalm 8, it points back to creation, how the Lord has created human beings a little lower than the angels. And... Um, and has given us to rule over everything. But you see, um, this is not our experience. See, how can we apply Psalm 8 to us human beings who, in our experience, we rule nothing? Even coronavirus, we don't rule over them. So, but, but if you come with me to Hebrews chapter 2, right? So we're moving from Psalm 8 to Hebrews chapter 2. And verses 5 to 10. So Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 10. Um, you'd see a, um, um, you know, the interpretation of this psalm um, through the heavenly principle of Jesus. You know, Jesus being the man that um, uh, this psalm has been pointing to. So Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 10, and it says this. It is not to angels um, uh, that um, he has subjected the world to come, that is God, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him, you make them a little lower than the angels. You crown them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. So that's Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. But then it goes on in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 8. It goes on to say this. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, that is to us, humanity. And humankind but we see jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of god he might taste death for everyone then verse 10 hebrews 2 in bringing many sons and daughters to glory it was fitting that god for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And then con continues on. But you see, Hebrew, uh, sorry, Psalm 8 talks about humanity ruling over everything. But to read it in this heavenly spiritual principle, it points to Jesus ruling over everything. And because he rules over everything, he is leading many of us. Uh, into a glory, the glory that he has, you know, been glorified after his resurrection. So, <clears throat> those two examples should give you um, enough to see that the way we're going about this application of the heavenly spiritual principle is that we will follow how the scripture itself um, applies uh, the scripture to us through Jesus uh, and through um, the heavenly spiritual principle that comes to us through the fulfillment of scriptures in Jesus. So because the scripture is fulfilled in Jesus, we have this heavenly spiritual principle through which we can read every passage um, in the Old Testament uh, and apply it to us today. So even though I've shown you those two passages uh, from Psalm 8 and from Deuteronomy 25, but um, in Scripture we see whole chapter of the Old Testament. That's what I will show you today. But not only whole chapters, 
but also whole geographical and historical frameworks. Uh, if you may remember from last week, I showed you from Hebrews chapter 4, a whole, you know, the, the generation in the wilderness going, uh, you know, from Egypt to um, through Joshua to inherit God's rest was also a type of us uh, going now through Jesus to enter the Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. the Sabbath rest. So you can see that this is what I mean by historical frameworks and geographical frameworks, whole geographical and whole historical frameworks from the Old Testament being applied to us through Jesus, uh, you know, being this spiritual, this heavenly spiritual principle. Now, let me uh, take you to Psalm 23 then and lead you through it. And if you have your Bibles open, why don't you read Psalm 23? And I'll, I'll be, I'll, give me a little bit of rest. I'll listen to you reading Psalm 23. I mean, I, I hope you have an IV, but whatever um, version you have, um, do you be able to read Psalm 23? Read it from the beginning where it says a Psalm of David. Read every Psalm you read, always read from the italics, um, bit at the, at the beginning of the Psalm. Okay, all right, go. Psalm 23, Psalm. a Psalm of David. The Lord, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes he me lie like down in green pastures. He me beside quiet He presses my soul along the right path. It's my Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. The rod and your staff will comfort me. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You are anoint my head with oil. I am cup flows. Surely goodness, and Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I would I doubt all forever. forever. Thank you. That's fantastic. Now, in the rest of the scriptures, we see Psalm 23 being heavenly, spiritually interpreted progressively. So, that's the key word for tonight, right? There is a progress as you go from the Old Testament through Jesus to the New Testament and even to heaven, to the new creation, okay? So um, if you have your Bible open, go to Ezekiel 34. So I want to take you through Ezekiel 34, John chapter 10, and Revelation chapter 7, right? In which we will see how this heavenly spiritual principle is being applied to Psalm 23 progressively, taking us through Jesus, uh, through Israel and Jesus to heaven and the new creation. Okay? My, my aim tonight is just to convince you how this principle, this heavenly principle, spiritual, is at work in the Bible itself, so that when we use it, we will always um, come back to the scriptures to show us how we should use it. We're not going to just apply it just um, in any way. We will, this is the reason why I'm taking you through the scriptures, because I want you to see this is how the scripture views the heavenly spiritual principle, and therefore, if we use it, we should follow how the scriptures, um, how, how it does it, okay? So first, Ezekiel 34. Um, you have your, um, I'll, um, your, uh, your, your Bible open. I'll read uh, Ezekiel 34 to you. Um, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you shepherds of Israel, only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, coat yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or search for the lost. 
you have ruled them harshly and crucially. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched to look for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals and because my shepherds did not search for my flock but cared for themselves rather than for my flock therefore you shepherds hear the word of the lord this is what the sovereign lord says i'm against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock i will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves i will rescue my flock from their mouths and there will no longer be food for them this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and there they will feed in a, in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down to glare the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. As for you, my flock, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and another and between rams and goats. Not enough for you to feed on the good pasture. Must you also tremble the rest of your pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest of uh, with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trembled and drink what you have muddied with your feet before this is what the sovereign lord says to them see i myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep because you shove with flank and shoulder budding all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away i will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. He will tend them, he will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. We'll just stop there in verse 24. But here, Ezekiel uh, in chapter 34 begins by telling us of a situation of no shepherd. So, I mean, if you recall, Psalm 23 begins by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. But what if there are no shepherd? And says that, you know, while there were shepherds in Israel, because the king and the priest were called the shepherds of Israel, even the prophets, they were not carrying out the role expected of shepherds. And so, therefore, Ezekiel, historically, is speaking from Babylon, being carried away to Babylon with um, people from Judah in the first part of the Babylonian exile. And so, Ezekiel refers to the Babylonian exile and the situation in which the people of Judah and people of Israel, the people of God, uh, were in. He's saying that... Um, that's the situation of having no shepherd there in verse 5. God's people were lacking in the shepherding leadership of the Lord, which should have been embodied in the human shepherds of Israel, the king, the priest, and the prophet. And therefore, because there was no shepherd, people are scattered, right? They were scattered in the exile for seven, 70 years, from 586 BC to 539 BC. 
And during the exile, they became food for all the wild animals. They're in verse 3. The shepherds of Israel only take care of themselves and not the flock. They did not strengthen the weak or heal the sick or bound up the injured or brought back the strays and search for the lost. They ruled over the sheep harshly and crudely. Verse 4. So therefore, God is against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for his flock. He will remove the shepherd from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. So you see the situation, right? The situation of no shepherd is the same as a situation where there are shepherds, actual shepherds, who just care for themselves, to feed themselves, to you know, satisfy their own gravings and have no care at all about the sheep. So God is saying that he will rescue his flock from the mouth of the shepherds. See, this is a very um, dire situation where the shepherds are eating the sheep. But the Lord will come and res rescue his sheep so that the shepherd will, uh, that the sheep will no, wrong, no longer be food for them, for the shepherds. And God himself will search for his sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. See, do you see this is God returning to Israel, the situation of having a shepherd, just like what David is saying in Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And actually, what God is saying here, it really means that the fact the, the shepherd will have no want when the Lord is shepherding the sheep because, you know, the, the, the Lord will search for the sheep, will um, look after them. And then, you know, we can almost hear uh, in the next, next few verses on from verse 13, you see that, we can almost hear Psalm 23 where, you know, the Lord is leading them through the, um, the valley of darkness or the valley of the shadow of death and, and bringing them out and, 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 and shedding up and, and, and sorry, and setting up a, uh, a table uh, in the presence of their enemies. And here in verse 13 of Ezekiel 34, it says that God will bring his people, his sheep from the nations and gather them from the countries. He'll bring them into their own land, and he will pasture them um, on the mountains of Israel. He will tend them in good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be the grazing land. And I'm you know, talking about the mountain heights of Israel being the, the pasture for the sheep when the Lord is shepherding them. I take that there may be a silent reference here to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That is, you know, that's when the Lord comes to shepherd his sheep. He's letting them grace on good, uh, in good pasture on the mountain heights of Israel uh, when Jesus gave them the Sermon on the Mount. But here in Ezekiel uh, 34 verse 14, we're told that they will lie down in good grazing land. And there they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. And the Lord himself will tend his sheep and have them lie down. He will search for the lost to bring them back and bring, the, uh, bring back the strays. He will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But he will destroy the sleek and the strong among his sheep. And he will shepherd the flock with justice. You see, his servant David will be the prince among them. And so the word prince here, see, it's not the, a shepherd. David will not come as a shepherd. David will come as a king. Prince is a king. So it seems that um, what, they, what God has got his people to look forward to is a resurrected David who will be king and who will shepherd his people, got the Lord's people, um, under God. And then um, 
in the next few verses, uh, verses uh, up to verses 26, which I didn't read, it talks about God making a covenant of peace with them and that the land will no longer have savage beasts. In fact, uh, savage beasts will live in the wilderness and the sheep in the forest and safety. So there will be a division. The savage beast will live in the wilderness. The sheep will live safely in the forest. And the Lord will make his sheep and the surrounding places they, uh, they live will be a blessing to them. And the Lord will send down showers of blessing upon them. Verse 26. And then it talks about the richness of the land, verse 27, and uh, you know the, uh, how the Lord will rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them, verse 27. They will no longer be plundered by the nation. So the Lord is gathering them to live in the house of the Lord, as in Psalm 23. Because in verse 28, you know, he told them that they will live in safety, no one will make them afraid and the Lord will provide for them a land renowned for its crops. They will no longer be victims of famine in the land nor bear the scorn of nations. They will know that Yahweh is their God and he is with them and there is people. And then in verse 31 at the end, he says, the Lord says to his sheep, you are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture and I'm your God. So you see here that Psalm 23 is used uh, to project the hope of Israel in exile to the future when the Lord will return to rescue them, to set them free, to bring them back to their land and to make their land a blessing for them. And the, the kingdom of David will be resurrected, which is the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. So with, with David being the Prince Shabbat here in Ezekiel 30, 34, Psalm 23 becomes a prophecy of the kingdom of God. So God's people are now uh, are meant now through this uh, interpretation of Psalm 23, they're meant to look forward to a kingdom kingdom where the Lord will shepherd them through King David resurrected. That's the only way in which David will again rule over his people. He will have to be raised from the dead. So we come to John chapter 10 then. If you have your Bible there, um, come to John 10. Um, and I'm basically looking at verses uh, 1 to 16. So what if you, um, what if you read, if you read the passage, John 10, verses 1 to 16. All right, go yeah. for it. Very truly, I very tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep of God by the gate, either climbs in another way, a thief and a robber, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The sheep hears his voice, calls his own sheep by name, leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. The sheep follow him they will never follow a stranger. They will run away from them because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech to show that they did not understand what he spoke to them. And Jesus said to them again, Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I am the door of the sheep. And listen to them. In the gate, where the people will be saved. They will come in or whoever find that. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Over we out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
hired hand does not the sheep. When he sees the wolf coming, does not own the sheep. But when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand. And he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. I must bring them also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I know that you, you're reading from different versions of the Bible, but anyway, yeah, we, we you're not uh, losing um, the basic elements of Psalm 23. So, remember in Ezekiel 34, we saw that even some of the elements of Psalm 23 are maintained in Ezekiel 34, isn't it? Mm. The only change, it seems to me, you know, in Psalm 23, it's David who's saying to the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, right? But in Ezekiel 34, you notice, it's the Lord saying to the sheep, you are my sheep, right? You see, that's very interesting to notice. Now, what's happening here in your reading? What are the elements of Psalm 23 that you can still hear uh, from from Jesus here in his person? That he's the shepherd. The shepherd is still there, isn't it? Yeah. So it says the Lord is my shepherd, but Jesus yes. says he is the shepherd. He the is good the shepherd. shepherd. Yep. And he knows his sheep. What else? Sheep. Is there something new that Jesus is adding to yeah. the, the story of the shepherd sheep relationship? Is it the difference between like um for like eleven and fourteen? So like how fourteen says like he lays his life down for the sheep? Like he yeah. adds, like, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so 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 looking at verse fourteen, uh, I know I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Yeah. So, but also you notice there that Jesus begins. What what's he talking about? The beginning. The gate. He's talking about the gate, isn't it? Yeah. Very okay. interesting. Because if you think There's back to the Old Testament, to Psalm 23, it doesn't seem to talk about a gate at all, isn't it? No. It's from the fact that when it says, um, you know, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, presumably they will have to enter through a gate to the house of the Lord, wouldn't it? So is this a Ezekiel passage? I remember there's another passage in the Old Testament where it's the... They were bad shepherds, like they were meant to be tending the flock of God, but then they were bad shepherds. Yeah, it must be um, Ezekiel 34. Yeah, let me just look it up. That we've just read. Yeah. yeah. Another. But but so so here is another interesting twist to the interpretation of Psalm 23, right? You see, he's talking to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were meant to be the shepherd of, of the people of God, right, in the time of Jesus. Do you see what, what's happening? And Jesus begins by saying that the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, right? The gatekeeper. So there's this, this some addition in this. There's the gate. There's the gatekeeper, right? Who will open the gate for the shepherd. And then there is the sheep who listens to the voice of the shepherd, the one who has entered through the gate. So I take it that Jesus begins by giving the ID of the shepherd, right? The identity of the shepherd. How would you know? the true shepherd from the false ones? Well, they will have to come through the gate, isn't it? And then in verses 7 and verse 9, Jesus said, I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. Verse 9, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Mm. Do you see that? So what's the implication of that for the shepherd? 
he has to be saved, isn't it? <laughs> he, he has to enter through Jesus, not be, to be saved. And in order for him, he has to become firstly a sheep of Jesus, isn't it? A shepherd will have to come in through Jesus and go out and find pasture for himself in Jesus. Do you see what's happening? Yeah. So the real shepherd will have to come through Jesus to be saved. And this is why Jesus is saying a thief or robber does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way in verse 1. You see? So in the line of Psalm 23, it seems that what Jesus is saying here, that one needs to enter through the gate to be able to say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. You see that? You can only say Psalm 23 once you've entered the gate. You can't stay outside the gate or climb in some other ways and claim that the Lord is your shepherd, isn't it? See, the shepherd of the sheep enters by the gate. And I think, you know, when I was reading through this and I was preparing, I was praying for myself as a, as a shepherd. That's why I like, the, I, I like, you know, saying that I'm a pastor of a church because that's the shepherd, right? But I was thinking of the situation of the Tongan church here in Sydney. And to me, I mean, I'm, I'm not um, trying to downgrade uh, my ministerial colleagues um, here in, in Sydney from Tonga. Do you know, I think if you think about what's happening in the Tongan church here, it's a situation of no shepherd, isn't it? Mm. The sheep are scattered um, and they're not cared for, right? Um, they're only there for, uh, for uh, providing, in order to provide the shepherd with their living expenses and their um what they call the home package right um but i mean you know we need to pray for the sheep that the lord will come and 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 and, she and shepherd them again because i don't think this sheep realize this is what's happening right anyway coming back to john chapter 10. so the gatekeeper you see it's the gatekeeper who opens the gate and who is the gate? Jesus is the gate. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in relation to Jesus, the gatekeeper should be the father, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The father yes. is the one who opens Jesus for the real shepherd and the real sheep to enter through Jesus. And, and the way we enter through the gate is that we listen to his voice, right? Do you see the first thing in verse 3? The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, that is for the shepherd, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Every time I pray for you people, I try to mention your name before the Lord, even your children's name. Because I believe it's very important, even, in, even though I'm just a human shepherd, I should know the name, even the name of, the, of your children. Uh, it was so good to see a lot of them uh, last Sunday during our Fakame. So um, let me uh, encourage you to continue on to feed uh, the Lamb of Jesus, uh, you know, the, our children at home with his word, getting them to memorize his, his word or, or to read his word and reflect on it. But anyway, so the sheep listen to his voice and then the shepherd, calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. See, by calling their names, the shepherd, the real shepherd, shepherd is able to bring out all his own. Do you see that? There is a sense in which we do hear the voice of Jesus. And where do we hear the voice of Jesus? Through his word, through the scriptures. You see, this is how we can tell um, people who love Jesus, who are the real sheep of Jesus, because they will always tune in to the voice of the shepherd. And, and the shepherd speaks to the heart of the sheep, you know, with his voice, with his word. And because we listen to his voice, the shepherd, the true shepherd, is able to call all of us out, out of this world. 
out to him so that he will feed us. And then we are told in verse 5 that he goes before the sheep, his own sheep follow him. Because, you see in verse 5, because they know his voice. But they will run away, um, they, they will run away from a stranger's voice because from a stranger because they do not recognize his voice. And she, you know, for, you know, friends, I believe that the real sheep of Jesus living in the church situation here in Sydney would, would hear the voice of the stranger and would run away from the stranger's voice because it's not the voice of Jesus. They would hear the different voice, the voice that comes in not with the word of God, not with the word of Jesus. So in verse 8, it seems that Jesus sees the Pharisees as included in all who have come before him and who are thieves and robbers. Do you see this? I'm not sure how you think about this, but if I were to stand before all my Faithful colleagues in Tonga and say to them, look guys, you're all thieves and robbers. I am sure they will be totally offended, wouldn't they? And, and, and you can see this is why Jesus, you know, at the end, when they had a chance to kill Jesus, they really insisted, even though they didn't see any, uh, any reason for Jesus to be crucified, but they, they, they really insisted on killing him because they were so offended by him, right? So because he, he's saying to them, you know, in chapter, eight, in chapter 9, he told them that they're blind. Uh, at the end of chapter 9, uh, you look up at chapter 9, he says in verse 40, um, some of the Pharisees, this chapter 9, verse 40, some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? In 41, Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So he's calling them blind and guilty. And here he's saying that they're thieves and robbers. And I think it's very important to ask the Lord because, you know, these are the shepherd, the people. If we were living in the time of Jesus, I'm sure if we hear Jesus saying these things, we may be offended as well because we would have thought, well, you know, the Pharisees, you know, these are the religious people. This should be a, these are the, the people who know, who knows their Bible. This is the people who are leading us, who are, you know, teaching the Bible to us uh, Sunday in, Sunday out, right? Jesus is saying these things to them. And then, then Jesus said, um, whoever enters through Jesus the gate will be saved and they will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And Jesus has come uh, that the sheep may have life and have it to the full. Now you see, it is very, very important to know that we are under a shepherd who has entered through the gate, right? And I'm not um, trying to put myself forward, but I'm saying to you that you need to pray for me as your pastor, that I will always find, uh, I will always hear the voice of Jesus. Because this is what I found from reading this, that I as a shepherd of, of Jesus' flock will have to first find a come in through Jesus, go out and find pasture through Jesus. And because I know that that pasture in Jesus, then I can lead others as well to Jesus to find life through the same pasture that Jesus is providing. Then Jesus said in verse 11, that I'm the good shepherd, verse 11 and 14. He repeatedly, he said, firstly, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And then he said, in contrast, the hired hand is not the shepherd because he doesn't own the sheep. And when he sees the wolf coming, and wolf here is meant to point out, to, to point to false teachers, people who come in, shepherds who come in just to, um, for their own benefit, you know, just to, to do the shepherding for their own benefit. Because the wolf always comes in to eat the sheep, right? So when the hired shepherd sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and run away, leaving the wolf to attack the flock and scatters it. And Jesus said that he runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep, verse 13. 
And then again, Jesus is the good shepherd. So the first time he says it, he's a good shepherd because he lays down his life for the sheep. That is, you know, we are protected from every wolf that will come along the way because Jesus has given his life to the wolf for us, in a sense, right? But also in verse 14, I'm the good shepherd because I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So there is a sense in which there is this intimate relationship. The good shepherd know his sheep and the sheep know the good shepherd. And so just as the father knows Jesus, verse 15, and Jesus knows the father. So we're told in verse 15, Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. So this is how much Jesus know, know the sheep. He know us, the sheep, um, to the extent that he can see that we really need him to lay down his life for us <coughs> in order to save us, in order to give us pasture. Because, you know, um, this is all connected in the Gospel of John. Uh, back in chapter 6, is telling them that he is the bread uh, of life. And, and, and it's all connected here with the shepherd and the sheep and the good shepherd laying down his life but then he says he has other sheep verse 16 now i know that the mormons are always keen to point out that this is his other sheep in america right because jesus according to the book of mormon went up ascended to heaven and then came down to america to preach the sermon on the mount in america in order to gather his other sheep the other sheep are the American sheep, right? But Jesus is not saying, I have other sheep in America. He's not saying that, isn't it? He's just saying, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. So what's he mean by this sheep pen? I take it that he's just talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Jews. And his sheep is already there, the, you know, the 12, the 12 apostles and others. And he's saying there are other sheep, not of this sheep pen, not, not from the Jews. So he's talking about the Gentile and he says, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. See, this is how the, the other, the sheep outside the sheep pen of Israel would know the good shepherd because they would listen to the voice of Jesus. They would hear his voice and his word. And then you see there, it says, there shall be one flock. And one shepherd. So in the end, um, the flock of Jesus is only one flock, right? We all come to the flock of Jesus by hearing his voice. And we all hear his voice because he calls us personally through that voice. The voice we hear in scripture is the voice that speaks into our hearts, into our soul. And that is the voice of the Good Shepherd speaking to us personally. And he is the Good Shepherd because he comes to us through his voice and he knows us personally. You see that? So here I think you can see that uh, just as in, in, in Ezekiel 34, you know, God is saying to the sheep, you know, you are my sheep. Here I think there's a two-way, right? The sheep knows the shepherd, the, sh the um knows the voice of the shepherd and the shepherd knows the name of the sheep. So to say with David, the Lord is my shepherd, um, assumes that you are in this intimate relationship with the shepherd, that you hear the voice of the shepherd and that the shepherd calls you by name. So that's why you say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So do you see there's, there's an intimate relationship, but we also see that Jesus is the gate. We come through him, you know, you know, to enjoy life, life to the full. Um, and, you know, and, uh, and we hear our names being called out. And when we come to him as the good shepherd, we, f we find him as the shepherd who is laying down his life for the sheep. And because he lays down his life for his sheep, he's throwing all his sheep into one flock. So we all belong to Jesus because we know that he is our shepherd.
because he lays down his life for us. Now, the last passage um, to see is Revelation chapter 7. So if you have Revelation, if you, if you open your Bible to Revelation chapter 7, and I would like you to just to read from, um, just from verse 9 to 17, right? Verses 9 to 17. If you have your Bibles open, verses 9 to 17, Revelation 7. All right, go for it. After this, I looked before me, me as a great multitude, great multitude that no one, one could count, count from every nation, every nation tribe, tribe, people, and language, people and language, standing before, standing the, throne before the throne and before, before the Lamb. Before the lamb. They were wearing white they were robes wearing and were holding palm branches, holding branches in their hands. Hence, they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels oh, and the elders and the living creatures and the and the worship God saying, Amen, Amen, and praise and, and, and glory and wisdom and things and honor and power and strength be to and our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I am. And said, so you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his time. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them and accept him with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamp at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. You will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yeah. So, what elements of Psalm 23 can you see being fulfilled here? Well, just the last verses where he leads the sheep to their to living springs of living water. Yeah. Wiping tears away. Yeah. Feeding them in verse 16. So I think this is an expansion of Psalm 23, verse 6, where it says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see that? So the house of the Lord in Psalm 23, where was the house of the Lord? temple well the temple was not yet built remember this is david's time oh, yeah it was a tent isn't it? it was a tent the tent of meeting was still there right so it was a tent in psalm 23 and then you remember we we came through uh, ezekiel 34 and it's still talking about the lord bringing his people back to the land of israel but the land will be renewed almost like the land of Eden, right? Where the savage animal will be able to live together with the lamb in harmony in the land, right? And then and, and there will be blessings in the land, right? That's still talking about a restored uh, geographical land of Israel for those who were to return from the Babylonian exile. And then we came to Jesus. And it's, all, it's all spiritual, isn't it? Yeah. It's really about entering Jesus as the gate, finding pastor in Jesus, and Jesus laying down his life for us. So the whole focus on the geographical, physical world is moved through Jesus to the spiritual, isn't it? And the majority of the spiritual things that the shepherd provides for the sheep um, comes through Jesus laying down his life for the sheep, isn't it? Yeah. And I think this is what we can see here, right? Here in Revelation chapter 7, this is a vision. If you read from verse 1, it's a vision where harm to nature is put on hold until the angel who has the seal of the living God put a zeal on the foreheads of the servants of our God, verse 3, right? 
So there is a sense in which, you know, um, things like coronavirus, right? These are natural disasters, disasters beyond our control. But they're, they're being held back, right? They won't harm everyone. And that's what we're starting to see, just like, you know, all the other uh, natural disasters that have come on the earth. They're being held back. And the reason we're told in chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, is because there is an angel, right? He's coming up from the east. The east is very, very um, interesting, right? Because the east is the, the place to which the temple of the Lord is facing all the time. This, um, this angel comes, he has the zeal of the living God. And then he calls out for them to the other angels not to harm the land or the sea or the trees until he puts a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then the, we're told in verse 4 that the number of those who were sealed, the 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel, okay? And I think, uh, I'm sure you know that uh, the Jehovah Witnesses, they make a, a big thing out of this. They say that these are the only people who will be saved in the end. It has to be the exact number. But I think... See, this is from the tribes of Israel. It means that there is a complete number of people who will be saved. It may not be that, but I think the number comes in in verse 9, right? Where after the whole thing, after the whole uh, vision of these 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, we're told that after this he looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And uh, they were wearing white robes. And you see, I think what we are seeing here is the, the heavenly destiny of those who've been shepherded, uh, those who've been shepherded by Jesus. Okay? So these are the people, because you see what they're saying, verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So they acknowledge that the Lamb has been their shepherd. And this is why they're standing in front of the throne, right? I, you may remember this is, um, this is assuming what Jesus was saying in John 10, that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And this is it, right? Salvation comes to them through the through God sending his son as the lamb to take away the sins of the world, and that's them, their sins. And then in verse 11, you see all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. So, so you see that in the middle, uh, in the center of heaven, is a throne of the lamb and the father. And around it are four living creatures. And then around, the, uh, around outside the four living creatures are the elders, the 24 elders. But then outside the 24 el uh, elders are the angels, right? And I take you there are hosts of angels looking into the throne of God in heaven and to this great multitude standing in the presence, in, uh, the presence of the throne of God and of the Lamb. But the angels... They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. You know, when they heard this great multitude crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, the, the, the whole host of angels, they fell down before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Now, I take it that this is what Jesus meant in Luke 15, where he says that when one soul repents, the angels in heaven rejoice, right? Do you see that what's happening here is the acknowledgement that salvation comes, they've been saved by God, by the Lamb, leads to the angel rejoicing, saying, praise God and glory and thanks. See, this is what's happening in heaven when one soul turns to Jesus Christ. And then, of course, you know, the elders ask, you know, those in white robe, um, 
the elders, one of the elders from the 24 elders said, um, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, um, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And, and, and so this is why they are there, right? This is why they are in the they are before the throne of God. And you see what they're doing in heaven? They're serving the Lord day and night in his temple. We don't know what kind of service that, but we know that it will be enjoyable. We know that it will be exciting. We know that it will not, it will never be tiring because you know we're serving the Lord, and that's what uh, we were created to do. We were created to serve the Lord. But there when we get to heaven being saved by the good shepherd and we will enjoy serving our Lord day and night in his temple. And uh, he who sits on the throne will shelter us, his people, his presence. And, and then you see the situation of we shall never be in want, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, I shall not want. Never again will they be hunger. Uh, never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. So even in heaven, we'll still be shepherded by the sheep, by the, by the lamb at the center of the throne. But you see what is his shepherd, his shepherding does? He is leading us to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So, in conclusion, we can see that Psalm 23 begins as the confession of David's faith, right? In the Lord being his shepherd. But then in its heavenly spiritual meaning becomes the, the word of prophecy in Ezekiel 33, looking forward to the restoration of Israel after exile. Under David, the prince shepherd who was shepherd under Yahweh, under the Lord. And then in John 10, we find that the prince shepherd figure of David is Jesus. He is the gate to God's sheep pen, God's one flock. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. His sheep knows his voice and he knows them by their name. And he calls them out, even from outside the sheep pen of the Jews. He calls them out and they hear his voice and they come to his one flock. And he protects them from the wolf for he cares for them. And his care is, of course, expressed in him laying down his life for his sheep. But then in Revelation 7, we can see that ultimately the lamb as the shepherd leads his sheep to the presence of God and to his presence in heaven. They have been washed by his blood and endure hardships for the good shepherd. Now the sheep, they can acknowledge their, that their knowledge of the good shepherd comes through them being saved by the good shepherd, by mm -hmm. his laying down of his life. So they're saying in heaven, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And, you know, serving uh, gladly ser uh, serving the Lord day and night in God's temple in heaven, no longer to be hungry or thirsty or suffer from natural disasters or even coronavirus. They're being, uh, they're being shepherded by the lamb at the center of the throne in heaven. So there is no more pain and suffering for God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, you see. So, Three things, right? I want to deduce from here about applying the, um, the scriptures to us through the heavenly principle. So we can see Psalm 23 being progressively applied spiritually all the way through Israel, through Jesus, into the heavenly realms, the heavenly reality in Revelation. The first thing to note is 
The material and physical elements of Psalm 23 remain throughout its heavenly spiritual meaning, isn't it? The shepherd, you know, the not want, the leading, the pastures, the living waters, the valley of the shadow of death, the staff, the, prepare, uh, the preparation of a meal in the presence of the enemies, the being followed by goodness and mercy all the days of the sheep's life, and even the living in the house of the Lord forever. So all the physical elements seem to remain throughout its uh, spiritual reading in Ezekiel 34, John 10, and even up to Psalm 2, Revelation 7. This means that when we read the scriptures through the spiritual heavenly principle, the heavenly spiritual principle, we need always to begin by understanding the physical, material, real, historical meaning of God's word before we read into it the heavenly spiritual meaning. Do you see what I'm saying? Before we apply Psalm 23 to heaven, we really need to understand that this is David, and this is in the Lord's house. It's not the temple. It's a tent of meeting um, you know, that has been built um, as a copy of the heavenly um, house of the Lord, right? That Moses saw on the mountain in Ezekiel, uh, sorry, in Exodus 25. So we really need to understand its physical, material meaning first. Secondly, the heavenly spiritualized meaning comes in terms of how God deals with his people in history. I think we said this last week. Now, in this second step, we need to consider the rest of scripture to see whether the passage that we are dealing with in the Old Testament is read in another way or is being interpreted. Now, what I'm basically saying here, that without you and me knowing your Bibles, we've got no hope in using the heavenly spiritual principle in our reading of scriptures. What I've just shown you is that in applying the heavenly spiritual principle to the Old Testament, you must know how the, the rest of Scripture uh, reinterprets or rereads the passage in the Old Testament, right, from the perspective of the heavenly spiritual principle. And I think we saw last week uh, in the promise to Abraham, right? That even the land points to the land in heaven, and that's in the Bible, right? So what I'm saying is we should never try to impose our own way of spiritual, heavenly interpretation to the scriptures, but should follow how the scriptures in interpret the rest um, of the scriptures, right? Or how the rest of the scriptures interpret this scripture that we're looking at now if there is no um spiritual meaning of the passage we're looking at in the rest of the scripture then you know i think we can say it may just point to jesus or it may be just you know um a physical material um application to us right and then thirdly, the third thing that I want to um, deduce from here is that ultimately Jesus provides the heavenly spiritual principle, lifting our eyes from this world to the heavenly spiritual world. Since you remember what I told you last week from John 18, he says that his kingdom is not of mm. this world. So, those are the three principles that we should. So, firstly, we should read passage in the Testament. Secondly, we should see whether it is being interpreted ways spiritually uh, in the New Testament or in the rest of the of the Old Testament. Does it still sound okay? But thirdly. Uh, you must realize that it's Jesus, right? Mm. Who makes it possible for us to read the scripture 
um, heavenly and spiritually, right? Mm. Any questions? Hi. Um, yeah, just me. Um, thank you so much, Marvel, for that. Um, I'm just curious. So, you know, when you're talking about the the heavenly and also um, when we read a passage to make sure we, we check, you know, in the New Testament, how, how would we be able to do that without knowing the whole Bible yet? Um, do you have any tips that yep. what we could do? Yeah. Uh, let me let me show you my Bible so that um, um, share screen. Uh, so that just to yeah, I think if you don't know your Bible, uh, then you need something like um, uh, like this, right? So if you go to uh, Psalm, say Psalm twenty three. This is just a Bible app, Marvel. Uh, yes, uh, I'm using, this is olive tree, right? But what I'm saying is, um, is, is uh, either, you, either you get a study Bible or a Bible with uh, references, cross-references. Mm. So study that. Bible, I think study Bible, hard copy study Bible will have the cross-references. So here in Psalm 23, I've given this, and I, if I click here in the A, and it gives oh, me all that, right. you see that? Yeah. Right. And then, and, and then, you know, even John 10 is there. We didn't touch on Psalm 28 verse nine, but if I go there, save your people and bless your inheritance, be their shepherd and carry them forever. See, there's a, 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 that's another way of reading it, asking the Lord to be their shepherd and carry them. See, so this is an implication that the shepherd, the Lord being the shepherd will have to carry his people. Right. Because like, uh, like the, eagle carrying you know uh, the, the young eagles on their wings to train them to fly this is the implication do you see what i'm saying mm. so you need to have one of these right and and there's john 10 verse 11 i'm yeah. the good shepherd okay. see but it, it still doesn't have things like revelation chapter yeah. 7 isn't it yeah. so that's so what to read our bible you may know this right but um but nothing could help um, like knowing your Bible inside out, right? So I notice this is why it's very important. Um, if you take the Bible seriously, you must try and read it once every year. I went to see a friend of mine, a Tongan friend on Friday night, and uh, I got to his house around about 11 to drink kava with him. And, and he has a little lamb and his tongue and Bible was open. And he said to me, and I saw it in Hebrews chapter 13. And he said, look, this is um, my finishing off my fourth time of reading the whole Bible. And he said every night he would sit with his little lamb and he would just read a whole patch of the Bible till he wants to go to sleep. So um, I was very much encouraged. This man is just a, a lay preacher in the Wesleyan church, but they, because he talks a lot about the Bible, they kind of push him around because they don't like people who know their Bible. Right. Yeah. So, so sorry about that, Sia, but there's no other way. Apart no, no. from getting a, a, a study Bible or a, um, this is the olive tree. And let me show you also the resources that I use. So in olive tree, I have this, right? You see it? I have an NIV study Bible. If I open it on Psalm 23, it gives you this. So this is, um, I mean, I, I, I bought a, a copy from my Setuata from Kurong. But I mean, if you have a computer, um, it's quite expensive to buy it. I don't know, about $40 or something uh, on Olive Tree. But here, here you get a lot, lot more things than what we did. Do you see that? See, even one Peter. All right. Before 1 Peter 5, before Revelation, we also have Hebrews 13, 20. So, and then, you know, the whole heaps of things of passages about flocks lying down in contented and secure rest. Does that, does that answer your question, uh, Sia? Mm. 
so yeah, I thank you NIV. so much. Yes. <laughs> I have the NIV, but I also have the, so I've, I have two. There's another, the ESV study Bible. I also have that. See, it's, it's sometimes the other ones is far more helpful. And then, oh, uh, Mahafo, is only three forty dollars a one off payment, or is that like a monthly payment? Or, yeah, well, it's a one off thing, okay? Yeah, that's pretty cheap because if you buy the study Bibles, they're about a hundred dollars, yeah, well, or something nice. like that for each. Well, this I, I bought this like four or five years ago, so I'm not really sure how much they cost now, but I, yeah. I bought this yeah, stuff, special. yeah, mm -hmm. online. But yeah, Thank I mean, you. Um, it's it's the cheapest study Bible that I got was eighty dollars. So you can get something um, cheap from Olive Tree or one of those. But Olive Tree is an app, right? If you, if you are okay, yeah, it's very helpful. It, 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 I mean, as far as I'm, I can see, it's 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 far more helpful than than Logos and other. Uh, things because I mean you, the app is free you can download it for free and it also has its store you know you can go shopping you can see there's a little trolley up there and if if you go to the side there is it, it will take you uh, to the shop right um uh, you know the, so that so it's already featuring NIV speaks today study Bible for 2499 I haven't seen that one but anything study Bible NIV uh, even speaks today should be considered helpful, and that's only twenty five dollars, right? Um, yeah. See, but you know, you know how in the Old Testament you're told to kill people. Mm. How do you apply that to us today? Because uh. that's what I was going to take you through, right? The passages about homosexuality. So they're in Revelation, um, where it talks about these things about do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman that is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal, defile yourself with a woman, must not present yourself to an animal. Um, and that is a perversion. Uh, but then, you know, on the other, I think here in, Re in, in Leviticus 20, they are to be put to death. You see that? If a man has sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own head. So do you see what I'm saying? How would you apply that to us today? I'm sure we don't want to commit murder, wouldn't we? But how would you apply putting to death to us? I don't know. Any thoughts before I show oneself? you? Putting Sorry? To your desires. What was that, Dan? Putting to death your desires, you know, dying to yourself. Yeah, I think that's what it comes to. Rather than putting the other person, it comes to them and you, right? Uh, where, where it talks about, you know, um, passages. Um, let me go back to NIV. Passages like Colossians, right? But um, doesn't it in the Old Testament? So in the Old Testament, there was a lot of punishments and stuff that was carried out by God's people. Whereas in the New Testament, a lot of that Jesus um, takes, like the the thing is that God does the judgment that God avenges, and we, we don't dish out the judgment ourselves. Like you, Paul says, so there's certain things if, say, for example, the passage on 1 Corinthians about removing the person who had sexual mm. relations with the stepmother, Paul says you hand them over to Satan. Yeah. So you kind of put them out. And so it yeah. concentrated more on God's people and what God's people was meant to display and then you were meant, if you had warned them and they had done stuff about it, then you would then um, hand them over to Satan and you leave it at that rather than you taking the, you know, the punishment to, to actually dish out the punishment. Yeah. 
Yeah, but but you see, that's what I mean by the spiritual <coughs> heavenly um, interpretation of it. Okay. See, I think the thing is, we in our minds, we should always say, the God of the Old Testament is still the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Um, so that we don't uh, make people feel that we had a different God in the Old Testament and we have a different God in the New Testament, right? Because it's still the same God at the end. He will come and destroy everyone in judgment, in revelation, destruction. I think, but isn't it marvel that even though it's the same God, but the difference is that Jesus is there? Mm. So because Jesus is there, then there's a lot that... Um, there's a changed way in the way that we relate to God when it's through Jesus. Is that how it works? Mm. Yeah. But, but still, what I'm saying is uh, the, the God who destroys people in the Old Testament using his people, like, you know, he destroyed, um, you know, the, the people of Jericho. Do you see that? He destroyed people of Jericho in order um, that his people, Israel, will inherit the land, right? Now, how should we read that today, you know, um, without saying that our God is just an unloving God, he will kill people um, out of the blue, you know, just to fulfill his own purpose, you know, making out, him out to be a very selfish ruler. Well, um, we have to understand that the Lord has given them 400 years while his people Israel were in, uh, in exile, in, 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 sla in slavery in Egypt. And therefore, it's to do with God's judgment upon people, right? So the destruction of the people of Jericho in the Old Testament is God's judgment on those people, which will still be the same when the Lord Jesus returns. Amen. Right? But Jesus, yes, I think you're right. Jesus has come. So the, the, the angry God of the Old Testament is still the angry God of the New Testament, right? Mm. But the only difference is, in Jesus, we're given a chance to turn to him before his, the destruction that we saw in the Old Testament uh, comes upon us. Uh, in the end, you know, he still remember that passage in Hebrews um, chapter 12, where it says that our Lord is a destructive fire. That's from the Old Testament. He's still... A destructive uh, fire for those who remain who remain unrepentant, who have, who have listened to the voice of Jesus and yet refuse to believe. Right. So um, in Hebrews, um, and Hebrews is the is the book where we see this uh, heavenly spiritual principle being at work. Right. Everything in the Old Testament, the temple priesthood, sacrifices, um, the tithing, uh, even belonging to Abraham. Everything is fulfilled spiritually in heaven, right? Uh, in the heavenly realm. So in Hebrews, we, uh, it's almost like uh, the heavenly temple, the heavenly realm is opened up and we can see the things that are happening uh, here on earth from a heavenly spiritual uh, point of view. A lot of people uh, have said that uh, Hebrews is, um, is, a, is a kind of a platonic um, influence um, in Christianity, but it's not. It's this thing that is heavenly reality being there in eternity before creation. And at the end, we will be going there, but... Um, uh, it will be a, to a totally glorious um, new creation with Jesus and us living uh, there. Awful. Yep. I have a question yep. in regards to like apologetics. Yep. So, like I've 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 grown up in Australia my whole life, like, and like. I work with like a, a, a lot of different people from different cultures who have migrated here. And um, like one thing has popped up in the last week or so 
is that we are a country that's post-truth. That that we can't that we can't know anything to be true. Um, and I've had a conversation, and like to me, when they say that, it sort of like uh, saddens my heart that they would say that you can't know anything to be true. Like, and it's as if it's a, a direct um, assault on on the Bible. Mm. Um, and so, I, I just when I when I address that question, I, I say like I say things like, um, well, if, if we can't know anything to be true, then there's really really no hope. Like life has no meaning. It's it's hopeless. Like it's the a cycle where we're born, we live, and we die. You know, and and like. Knowing the culture, it's like we could care less, yeah. you know, um, the sort of macho culture. And so, like, from my heart, I really want to try and, um, you know, I do do the gospel justice in in being able to share it with, with love and grace, but also um, be clear cut, you know, bring it with clarity. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yep. Especially believing that God's word is truth, um, and that that it's the it's the basis for truth, and believing that we can know truth because of God's word, because of Jesus. And so, yeah, what would you say? What would you say? Like, what would you say if you, if you were confronted with a question like we can't know truth, um, you know, and we could care less about about the Bible, about Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Sure. No, I think. Yeah. I think. I mean, in my mind, uh, I would just say to them, "Look, look, mate, look, mate. I mean, if, if there's no truth, how do you know? How can we know that what you're saying is true? Right? Because if there's no truth, even your statement should not be believed. Because you're you're claiming there is no truth." But you want me to believe that that's the truth. So which truth you want me to believe? Do you want me to believe your truth? That there is no truth? Or my truth, that is Jesus, is the truth? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. So there is a, there's a certain self-contradiction in every... I mean, this is happening... Yeah, because, you know, people are claiming all that. Sort of false truth, false whatever it may be. They always... People are always, you have to tune in every time they're starting to make those claims. You know, it's just the same like, you know, when people say, uh, you know, we shouldn't impose your belief on me. Yeah, yeah. Right? I get that a lot, yeah. It's just the same. Yeah. And you are telling me that we should believe your belief that I should not impose my belief on you. Do you see that? So, yeah. if there is no truth, we should not be able to talk anymore, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the well. That's the, the that's the consequence of having no truth. Because you see, you are sitting there and you are you are claiming to understand, Daddy. More, right? Daddy. Because there is a standard of mm -hmm. truth, standard of meaning, in which you and me are both using, you know, to understand each other, isn't it? Yeah. We're both drawing on it. So if there is no truth, we should not say anything an anymore. We should, you know, I mean, the I I'm, I'm surprised that people like that are still talking. Mm. They should shut up. You know, <laughs> if there is no truth, no talking, because mm. once you start talking, you're starting to talk no, no truth. And why should we listen to any, see? Yeah. But I think pastorally, um, um, uh, Josh, uh, we should say to people, look, you know, your, your doubt about the truth is a statement of faith. Mm. I used to be like that too. You know, yeah. you should always go back to how you came to know the truth, right? You should say, look, you know, you, you're showing doubts in the truth, and that's why you're saying there's no truth because you're doubting the truth. 
And, you know, that's good. That shows that you have to begin by assuming there is a truth in order to say there is no truth, right? But I was in your position too. I used to doubt the truth mm -hmm. and decided at some point maybe to find out, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then, you know, say, look, look, look mate, the, the, the very reason why we can still talk is, you know, mm -hmm. tells us that there is, you still believe in truth. You don't, you don't, you're not, you don't believe what you're saying, you know? Yeah. So we should point out to people that they're contradicting themselves. Secondly, we should point out to people that what they're doing is they're just putting up a whole, a big screen to prevent them from coming or being confronted by the truth or from seeking to know the truth. Mm. Right. And we should say just, uh, so that's why you should always go back. So in the, situ in the current situation, people will always appreciate your, the way in which you come to know the truth. Mm. Because at least that's the, that's the only reality they can see, isn't it? Yeah. Even if they deny the truth, you should say, look, you know, even if you deny that there's no truth, maybe you can look at me and, and, and see me, you know, in my journey as somebody who was like you, but he came to know the truth. And maybe you can, you know, because you're just a human being like me, mm. you can find out like I did. So, Marfa, I'm just share, I've just shared onto the English service um, messenger, like the um, YouTube thing uh, with uh, John Lennox and um, oh, okay. the, yeah, because there's actually a lot. So the, the guy, John Lennox, is a professor in, uh, it's not Harvard, I Oxford. can't remember. Oxford. Professor, uh, professor of Mathematics in Oxford. Yeah, Professor of Mathematics. And he's really, really good yeah. at um, answering all these um, arguments against Christianity and against faith. And I think just watching it, I think it's really important nowadays to for ourselves to prepare ourselves and to um, equip ourselves so that we're able to answer and not fall away. I think sometimes uh, these people come up with a lot of arguments and it confuses us. And then eventually, if you're not with uh, surrounding yourself with good people or good friends and, and not having good Bible teaching, then it's actually really easy to either go off on a tangent and, and do something that's totally unbiblical, or you just fall off Christianity and you, you think that you, you don't really know anything anymore. Um, so yeah, sorry, just mentioning that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, the passages that I've listed here on the side, if you, um, uh, you hope you can look at it. You, can you see it? Is really how homosexuality is interpreted in the Bible. Okay. Um, so if, if we were to start from Genesis 19, 5, um, where um, they called to Lot, um, you know, these are the people of Sodom calling to Lot in the evening, where are the men, who, the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. And, um, you know, and so this is why it's called uh, sodomy, because this is what the men had wanted to do, um, and 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 you, I mean, if you, if you read Genesis eighteen, you see this is God, right? They wanted to do it to God, right? God was coming to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and they wanted to uh, homosexually um, have sex with the Lord. Anyway, so Leviticus um, eighteen twenty two then says, "Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman that is detestable." Right. Again, in Leviticus twenty thirteen, if a man has sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They had to be put to death, and their blood will be on their own heads. Now, I take it that putting to death the homosexual is the judgment of. It's not us now, right? In the Old Testament, it was for the God's people to do that. 
But nowadays, it's not for us to do it. It's God who will do it at the end. Okay? Uh, uh, God's judgment will come to them in the end. Okay? And then Deuteronomy 23, uh, verse 18, you must not bring uh, the earnings of, well, a female prostitute or of a male prostitute. So assuming that some people did that, right? So even their earnings should not be brought into God uh, as a way of paying your vow to God because the Lord God detests them. And then, see, this is the New Testament, right? In the New Testament, there is no spiritualizing of homosexuality. We're just told here, in the same way, so here is um, Paul, uh, verse 26, Romans 1, because of this, uh, and this is, he's talking about idolatry, right? Idolatry is the exchange of the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. Now, that's what happened, you know, when they created the golden calf. In the wilderness, they exchanged the glory of the Lord who rescued them from Egypt with a, a created a creature, right? And they worshiped the creature rather than the Lord. They called the creature the Lord. If you go back to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 32, you'd see that they referred to the golden calf as, as Yahweh. But here we're told that that's the heart of idolatry the exchanging of the glory of God for a created thing. Then in verse 26, because of this idolatry, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. You see, it's shameful lusts, right? Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, homosexual attraction is the same as heterosexual lust. Because some people today are saying, look, you know, if you only have homosexual attra attraction and you're not um, practicing it, you know, you are okay. You're not sinning at least. But we should not say that, right? I understand some Christians, some evangelical Christians are saying that today. And I think to me, it is the starting of evangelical people giving in to the lies of the evil one, right? We should say it's shameful lusts. Uh, it is this um, desire, right, that the Lord has given as a result of idolatry. Uh, and then it eventually results in the practice of it. But even the lust itself is shameful, which is what Paul is saying here. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Right? So there again, the lust. And then men committing shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So you'd see that even here we're told that God punishes some who practice homosexuality physically in the act of doing it. Right? Maybe not all, but we are meant to see the due penalty of their error physically in themselves, right? And then, of course, um, you know, we come to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. I take it that the fact that we are told not to be deceived is that we will be deceived, right? As it is now, we are told that you know, some sins are okay. But Paul is saying, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, no idolaters, no adulterers, no men who have sex with men, no thieves, no greedy, no drunkards, no slanderers, no swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. I told uh, Bessie, one of my cousins who uh, studied under me, it's a Dotai, and it's now finishing it with a master's from uh, one of those theological institutions uh, under the Methodist Church in California. He's just finishing off his um, graduation uh, is next Monday. And, uh, you know, um, then they, they call you up and interview your belief about, especially about homosexuality. And um, 
I, I spoke with him last year when I was in America in America and I reminded him, look, you know, we were brought up to believe the Bible. So don't give him give in your soul, you know, in order to get a job for money. Don't even say like our tongue and trends are saying, look, you know, just lie in order to get in. No. Once you lie, you can't get out of it. So um yeah, so they called to interview him and he, you know, he said, Look, you know, I believe the Bible. And they said, Look, what if um a homosexual couple come to your church and they said that they have repented of every sin except this one sin. Um, would you say they're okay? Because, you know, of course, you know, it's not a sin anymore, right? Homosexuality. And um, my cousin said to them, look, um, homosexuality is just like any other sins. Um, it needs to be repented. Um, you know, I love if people, if homosexual people come to my church, I will welcome them, but I will teach them uh, that the Lord can change. Them. And then he was told that it's now illegal in America to do that. It's illegal to, to say that they can be changed. <laughs> and I said to him, look, maybe they should shut the church up then. There should be no more church because why, why do you have church? The purpose of church is to to bring the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus you know, uh, into people's lives. But if that's illegal, it's illegal, well, why should there be a church? Maybe they, they should go do something else. <laughs> but anyway, so you see that with things like homosexuality, it's not spiritualized, right? It's being, car it's being carried through, but now we are told when we get to 1 Corinthians six two things we know that they can be changed right by the gospel but secondly they will never inherit eternal life it's not unloving of course you know when you start saying that's what exactly what israel Folau put put forth in his uh, you know that thing that he got in trouble for um you know when you start saying these things today um people start playing you uh, blaming you for hate speech Right, and um, so that's the kind of culture we're living in, Josh. Probably what they mean by both <coughs> truth. It's not truth anymore. It's either a hate speech, or a um, what they call in America a, um, a hack speech or something. What do you do when you're hacking people? Uh, yeah. So either you you say things like this, or right now they call it a hacking culture, where you're meant to say things. To make people feel they're being hacked, that they're being uh, accepted, they're being, um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're not supposed to say anything. So it, there's no longer any truth value. It's just you and me uh, hating or wanting people to feel good about themselves and about what they're doing, right? Well, um, is there any if if any other comments and any other other questions? Yes, uh, sorry, my friend. How about we spend some time praying? See this? Yeah. Hey, in my father, John, John ten fifteen. No, uh, no. When we were reading, I saw that the uh, <clears throat> that the uh, shepherd uh, laid down his life for the sheep. Is that? Yeah mean that Jesus only laid down his life for his sheep, the, the one that he was called, not for the whole world. Oh, a limited atonement, uh, as you say. Yeah, I think um, there's a passage in, in, in um, 2 Peter 2 that, that says the same thing. Yeah. Even though Jesus died for the whole world, uh, his death uh, was more specifically for the elect. Right. What was that? Second um, Peter. Uh, one. Uh, Second Peter two. Two. Okay. Uh, it used to be there. They may have moved it somewhere else, but um, um, but uh, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, and they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. See, even, even the false teachers, right, who will deny uh, the so, so, sovereign Lord, 
they will deny the sovereign lords who bought them. So these false teachers are lost. But do you know what I'm saying? And in yep. their lostness, they're denying the sovereign lords who bought them. Even yep. false teachers were bought by Jesus. By his Jesus. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Bringing yep. swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow the, the depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute in their great and then it goes on. But then uh, if we go to 1 John 2, and this is the other side, right? 1 John 2. Uh, I write to you, to you as you will not, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for us, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do you see the us and the whole world? Yeah. So, in fact, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but more specifically for us. For the sheep. So um, the whole world are not saved simply because Jesus died for them, yeah. right? Yeah. They need to be like us to be born again into the family of Jesus. So there is a, a sense of a limited atonement in Scripture, although you should not also um, say that Jesus did not die for the non-elect. No, Jesus died for the whole world. Yeah. But only the elect will be saved through his death. How do you know that you are an elect? Turn to Jesus, right? Yeah. That's the only way we know. Because we yeah. are elected in Christ. We don't know the other side, the eternity side of things. We yeah. only know what eternity has done to save us, the lost. Yeah. And what eternity has planned before the creation of the world uh, was to slain a lamb. Mm. And we're told that even before the lamb was slain, uh, he has a book of life uh, upon mm. which the names of those who will be saved have been written. This is for you and me, uh, we're, we're born or we're even conceived, right? Yes. So God has already always planned to save the world, the universe through Jesus. Jesus died for everyone but especially those who turn to him in repentance and faith. So, we'll tell you how we'll a bit. Goya. Yeah. Thanks. Another one, Hebrew 8.13. Yep. Hebrew 8.13, by calling this covenant new, I mean, he's talking about the new. Yeah. He has made the first one obsolete. And once the obsolete and updated will soon disappear. Is that Hebrew the old 8, covenant? 13? Yes. Oh. Yes, that, that's, you know, I think I, I came to this understanding only a few months ago that we no longer live under the old covenant. Yeah. We live under the new covenant. So what's the difference? Well, in the old covenant, you were expected to sacrifice for the forgiveness yeah. of your sins, bulls and goats and stuff. Yes. You were expected to uh, keep days of festivals like the Sabbath, the seventh Sabbath, day. Yeah, yeah. It's all part of the old covenant. Now, it's all fulfilled in Jesus. Yes. And Jesus said the most important, two most important commandments, right? To love yes. God with all your hearts, all your soul, all your strength, and to yeah. love your neighbor as yourselves. And the, the whole law is fulfilled in that. And I take it that that's what Paul means by saying in 1 Corinthians 9, right? I showed that to you last week, I think. 1 Corinthians 9, 21. Um, happy to read it again. Um, where he says, uh, you know, this is, his, this is his evangelistic strategy, right? Verse 20. To the Jews that became like a Jew, to win the Jews. Which means he was no longer a Jew, right? He has to become a Jew, right? In order to win the Jew, because he was no longer considering himself a Jew. He was a Jesus man. Right, a Christian. Christian. To those under the law, I have to become one like under the law, though I myself am not under the law. Do you see that? Mm. The law was the old covenant. It was no longer under the old covenant. We're no longer under. So we're no longer under that. As so as to win those under the law. But then on the other hand, verse 21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though 
I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. So he's under Christ's law. He's not under the law, but he's under Christ's law. So what does that mean, or to be under Christ's law? Well, Jesus said in John 13, 34, the new commandment I give unto you is to love one another. And love fulfills everything, isn't it? If you love God with all your heart, you love your neighbor, you won't cause any harm to your neighbor. You won't kill your neighbor. You won't steal from your neighbor. You won't commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. You won't lie to your neighbor. Do you see that? Yes. That's why when it comes then to things like the Sabbath mm. and eating the food laws, Paul says the principle is love, right? Right? If by eating a piece of meat, my brother in mm. Christ is led to, to be stumbled, I, I would stop eating meat, even though I know it's just a piece of meat. That? We are free. Yes. But love yeah. becomes then the right. restriction. I love my brother enough not to drink wine because I know he may, mm. if he sees me drinking wine in public, he may be led into sin, right? Yes. Even though I know drinking wine is not a problem with, with Jesus, right? You see that? Right. Love is the principle. And the same with the Sabbath. Read Romans 14. Uh, remember Romans 14, you report where Paul says, um, if somebody uh, considers one day holy, yeah. well, you do it for the Lord, see? Yes. So the, and the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt. For the, Lord. the one who yeah. does not. The one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. See? Yeah. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so for the Lord. Whoever mm -hmm. eats meat does so for the Lord. So what I always say to my um, Seventh-day Adventist friends, I said, look, you know, I respect your, your giving of the Seventh-day Sabbath. I have no condemnation for you. True. Yes. And, and you should look at us and stop condemning us for right. living the Christian Sabbath. Because that's what Paul is saying. The principle is love. Okay? Mm. And that applies to these things. So that's what it means to live under the new covenant. The old covenant is obsolete. Absolutely. It's no longer. So let no one. That's why Paul says, let no one judge you in terms of food. Or um, mm. because they're judging you festivals. in terms of food and festivals from the mm. old covenant. Old covenant, that's right. Yeah. And in Romans seven, it's like we were married to the old covenant, right? Mm. And the old covenant remains, but we die. So once you die with Christ, right, you're being raised to marry another person. <laughs> that's what he says, right? But you remain, you're meant to remain dead so the other person can marry whoever they want. But you're dying and you're being raised again with Jesus. You are uh, no longer the same person who died, right? So as a new person, then you can choose to marry another person. So you choose to marry Jesus. The law remains. It's still good, but it has nothing to do with you because you're now married to Jesus now. And you live by his spirit. And through the spirit of Jesus, you are able to do more than what the law requires to those in the Old Testament, right? Right. The fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Spirit. You read in the Old Testament, nothing like that is there, right? Yeah. So yeah. We, we do more for God. We're given, our God is richer and sweeter for us under the new covenant in Jesus. Right. Well, that's a whole lecture I was meant to give to you some at some later stage, but now I've given it to you, so maybe I shouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> now you've all got it now. New, new covenant. We live under the law of Christ, wow. not the law of the Old Testament. So that when people come to you with those questions, why aren't you keeping the seventh day? Why aren't you, um, why are you eating pork? Why are you doing this? And you should say to them, look, I, I, I love you in Christ and I respect you. I don't, the Bible says, if you do it, do it for Jesus, not do it because you want to save yourself, right? That's the wrong way of living. Yeah. If you keep living, doing the law, living under, trying to live under the old covenant to save yourself, you won't be able to save yourself. 
uh, you'll be cursed, right? Because everyone is under the curse of the law who tries mm. to live by the law. Right. True. So try to understand how we live and, 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 and think about it. And every day, you know, think about that. You love God with all your heart, all your, uh, all your soul and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and more is fulfilled in that. Okay. So it goes back to knowing, your, knowing the Bible, right? <laughs> <laughs> know your yeah, Bible. There's no right? excuse. Um, thank you for bringing the Bible in the Facebook page. I read. <laughs> I try to read it every time you put that passage. And I may not comment there, but I always try to read it because to me, uh, it's almost like God saying to me, read this today. Don't <laughs> skip it. Every time you see God's word somewhere, read, read it, it, please. Don't skip it. Don't oh, say, oh, yeah. I know that I was reading this this morning. Read it again because maybe God wants you to read it again because you never understood it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> any other co final comments? It's nine o'clock. Now we should go. Yeah. It's... Everyone okay? See ya, Dilla. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I know that you guys are busy, but I uh, really appreciate that you make the effort to be here. Uh, where's our friend Holla and Benny? Oh, Ben is there. Where's Hola? Oh, Hola's a uh, uh, bit sick. Too much training, too much steps. <laughs> you had a two hour, eh? right. two hour well, walk. Well, we'll keep praying for him uh, <laughs> uh, to get Trying away to from get the, the things of the set. <laughs> We've just come back from uh, what, what? How many hours, Vesina and Sarah? Six hour walk. <laughs> yeah, oh like, wow! I, I thought they were not yeah, going to come home. Then. <laughs> they left. Uh, they left our house uh, before twelve. Mm, they didn't come back until six thirty. So we, we, <laughs> um, we happy to have her back because we thought that she was walking to heaven or somewhere. Maloe, loe. Oh, I got the hita, malongoa. Anyway, that's a walk. Um, any special Thank prayer you. requests 